Starting off today with Nonsuch Brewing's Baltic Porter. Uh, they don't have any interesting tasting notes on the can, but uh, I've been having this one quite a bit. And I'm liking the sort of little bit of dark chocolate uh, overtones and you know, malt roast, stuff like that. It's just a very nice drinking porter. I'm pretty pleased with them. And I'm hoping that once all this pandemic stuff's over, I can actually get back down to their uh, tasting room, which is also a very nice little environment. So today I am going to be playing with this little Sonoff basic Wi-Fi switch thing that my buddy Another Maker sent a very long time ago and I just found it again when I was doing some cleaning up around here. Um, that's actually going to be a theme going forward for the next few weeks is messing around with things that I found while I was cleaning up because as you might expect there's a lot of them. So what this is is a as it says in the box, a Wi-Fi controlled switch. Uh, it is designed for controlling line voltage anywhere from uh, 90 to 250 volts AC, 50 or 60 Hertz, doesn't matter. Um, it can control up to a 10 amp load and you just wire up uh, your AC mains coming in and your load going out. And then you do some magic with it using their proprietary, uh, uh, app and stuff like that and you can make it uh, just control whatever it is you've got on there they've got a whole ecosystem of these things and similar so as you can see there's a bunch of different uh, wi-fi ver things that uh, in sonoff's line but the basic is the one that we're interested in but they all sort of work in their closed ecosystem with their proprietary app and i mean if you're into that kind of thing great I prefer not to. I prefer to have a little bit more control over the stuff that's on my Wi-Fi. So I am going for a bit more uh, homebrew sort of an approach. A very common option, uh, especially with, uh, with makers and DIYers and hardware hackers and stuff, is to use it with Home Assistant, which is a sort of an, an open source and community run type of uh, home automation system. And it's really cool. But that is way deeper than I want to go. I'm probably going to get there eventually, but for right now, that's that means setting up servers and a bunch of other stuff, and I'm just you know, not into doing that right now. I'm going for something a little bit more easy. If you were going to use it with the, uh, with the Home Assistant stuff, Tasmota is a firmware that ha that the community has developed and it's very straightforward and it works pretty well with that si the environment but again that's not the direction that i'm going today however that doesn't mean that i can't learn from their experiments and discoveries uh, there is a basic there uh, one of the basic units there similar to the one that i've got and it shows those pins there which are the programming header three volts rxtx and ground and there's also a GPIO uh, input there too, which we will play with and I think make use of. Let's pop the little module out here and you can see there's not a whole bunch to it. Um, this is the input side. There is essentially, well, there's a fuse and then uh, a little power supply in there. Nothing too fancy, just Pretty much a little switching power supply to power the chip um, and then we have a relay there which connects to these huge wires and goes over to the load side nothing too bizarre going on there um, you can see the wi-fi antenna over here We've got a push button led and the one chip that is doing the magic and that chip in this case is an ESP8285 which is the brother of the uh, ESP8266 which a lot of us are familiar with it's it's the chip in a lot of these IOT products uh, the D1 mini the little lowland board the full-size D1 the 8285 is a little bit less common in maker world but it still gets its uses and as a bonus it can also be programmed with the Arduino IDE, the same as the 8266. So that is a benefit to this because lots of smart people have gone before me 
and created uh, YouTube videos and web pages and instructables and stuff like that on how to reprogram this guy, which is what I intend to do. I hope to do um, because I don't want to use their proprietary app and their proprietary software. But regardless, there is that programming header ground TXRX 3.3 volts. And this one, the fifth pin is marked IO2. So I'm going to have to keep that in mind if I plan on using it. The button on this is connected to uh, GPIO zero, which is the button that you, or which is uh, basically the flash line. Um, if you hold that low when this thing powers up, it is supposed to put the chip into flash mode, which is one of the uh, important things to remember about the ESP chips is that you have to manually put them into flash mode. You can't just uh, uh, send the, some data to them and accept, expect them to accept it. So in order to experiment with this, uh, just to get software up and running properly, I've put a D1 Mini, which has got the e two, ESP8266 on it, on a breadboard, and I've connected a relay and an LED to what the research tells me this LED and this relay are connected to, and I've got a button that I need to connect to that GPIO. I've just got it connected to a random one right now. I'd initially planned to use the D1 Mini on this little Wemos tripler base, which just basically parallels three things in its plug-in format, and then use one of these really uh, shields with it to do this and you know plug an LED and stuff like that, just to make it really easy rather than using a breadboard. But then I noticed that this relay is a 12 volt relay which is really bizarre that's a 12 volt coil but there's no 12 volts available anywhere on any of the input pins any of the power pins there's 3.3 volts there there's 5 volts there and the rest of it is all you know uh, the 3.3 volt logic there is no 12 volts anywhere this connector is on the contacts which is nothing to do with the coil that can be anything so I couldn't see any way of using these little modules, which is really kind of annoying because I don't know. Um, did the Chinese sellers screw up and just assemble these wrong? It should have a five volt relay on it. Like this one over here, which is just, you know, a standard Arduino type module, but whatever we'll, uh, we'll persevere with, uh, with loose components like that. It's good to have options. So now that I got some experimental hardware sorted out, let's uh, see if we can throw some code at this thing. Now this is using a much more complex piece of code that I found someplace on the internet. And for reasons that I can't quite explain to myself or to you, I can't find it again with some Google searching. If I do, I'll put a link down below, but it, it's not important. This is just a, a step. Anyway, I've got the LED and the relay defined. LED still on 13, the relay is on GPIO 12, and I've just got them going on and off together. Anyway, it just looks like this. When I turn the relay off, it goes off. When I turn the relay on, it goes on. For whatever reason, I programmed them backwards, but there you go. You can see that as I'm clicking, it's changing states. So one more step in my experimentation. But after further messing around with that code, trying to expand it into something that I could use for what I wanted to do, um, it, uh, I don't know, it, it proved to be way too advanced for me to wrap my brain around. So I did some more digging around and found another really basic piece of code, basically just to create a Wi-Fi LED, and then I expanded it from there. It just uses the Wi-Fi library, SSID and password, I've chosen to create static IP just so I know where to find it on my network uh, eventually rather than having to figure it out uh, with DHCP all the time. Uh, define the relay and the LED same as before. The push button. I've got it on GPIO 14 right now, which is D5, and then set up a few states, yada, yada, create things, set some initial conditions, set up the Wi-Fi. This is the part that I added here just to read the button in the in the Wi-Fi client loop. Um, I, I still don't understand exactly. It looks like it's using stuff in the library mostly and just has a loop constantly running with some, uh, calling some uh, stuff that's down here, that's defined. But 
in that loop while it's just sitting there waiting for a Wi-Fi client, I've got it reading the button, um, checking what the relay state is, toggling the relay state and the LED with it. If the relay state is the other, you know, you know just basically toggle the thing. It's, it's probably not the most, well, I can guarantee it's not the most efficient code because I wrote it, uh, but it seems to work. And this is from the example that I found as is all this stuff. Um, I added relay state in there just so that I could read it up in that loop. And that is all of this, all of the, uh, the loop stuff that, that is basically doing it all. And then down here is again, the web server stuff that I don't really understand fully because I just copy and pasted this from somebody else's example. And again, if I can find that basic example, I will link to it but no guarantees because I spent a lot of time hunting for this and I didn't keep good notes. So same functionality as before, LED on, LED off. Notice with the static IP address that I created. The difference is I've added a push button with a pull-up resistor, so I can also control it from here. LED's on there, I can turn it off from the website, turn it on from the website, and I can turn it off from there. So that, is the functionality that I want. Um, if I didn't want a local push button to turn this thing on and off independent or yeah, without uh, having to go back to a computer, then I could have just used this thing as it is, but I want that push button. So now I have to uh, figure out how to get that code onto there and also figure out that IO2. And just quickly solder a header on there just to make life easier when I'm programming this thing. Unfortunately, the fifth pin isn't on the header. Uh, it's not drilled through. It just shows up there only. So I'll only be able to put the uh, programming and power on there, but that's not a big hardship. The more annoying thing is that I've only got, in four pin female headers, I've only got these really long ones. I'll have to remedy that in a future mailbag. And it's not a huge hardship, but it's nice to have the right tool for the job sometimes. I'm also just going to tack a wire onto this one that's labeled IO2 here, just so that I can experiment with it and find out what it really is. Because that doesn't match anything that I found on any of the stuff online. That doesn't have to be a high current wire because of course it's not going to be carrying any current to speak of. Now to talk to this thing, we need a, a UART board that can do 3.3 volts. There's one there. So this button here, I think I mentioned it earlier, is supposed to be GPIO zero on the chip and so you hold that down when you're powering the thing on and it should just work hopefully now then another thing that is warned about everywhere is that you can't trust that the low voltage side isn't ground reference to the mains it shouldn't be but there's probably going to be some leakage through there so when you're programming it never have it connected up to mains just connect it to your computer Potential for all kinds of disastrousness on your computer. And I need to hold that down while I'm plugging it in. So that should theoretically put it in flash mode. You should be able to, yep, yeah, we're on USB zero. All this stuff is still default. Oh, wait a minute. No, I need to change it. Uh, I need to change the board to ESP 82 eight five module this is legit the first time i've tried this so we'll see what happens connecting hey it's uploading it's actually uploading i shouldn't sound so surprised because i'm following somebody else's instructions but i'm always impressed when a microcontroller thing works the first try okay huh I hate it when something sort of works. I've got it working on my own hardware. 
now I'm working on this little Wi-Fi module here and I've got it I mean it's it's inverted but that doesn't matter yeah that's... but the relay on there is also supposed to click at the same time and it doesn't hmm. and this wire is connected to a switch on the back which is supposed to work when I ground it but It puts it into that mode, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> that could be panic mode, I'm not sure. The reason that the um, thing started flashing and acting weird when I uh, when I effectively pushed my uh, push button was because I don't have a pull-up resistor on that I.O. So I'll just take my... Uh, my 10k resistor and put it in there. I think I'm going to need some heat shrink sleeving too. That ought to do it. And it's still in the low voltage side, so it's not going to cause any issues. I hope. Well, a great deal of troubleshooting has gone on. And it was all in the code, which doesn't surprise me because, as I've said many, many times, I'm horrible at code. But... I finally persevered and I think I've got it. So if I push the button, hmm, why did it take so long? Anyway, you can see that that's come on, the lights come on. Okay, maybe I just wasn't pushing it well enough. These are cheap crappy buttons. So there's that. And then over here we have this. I can turn it on there and I can turn it off there hmm I need to debounce that maybe anyway I can turn it on here and I can turn it off over there I've just got some very primitive debouncing happening in the software and I may need to adjust that slightly but I think it's working, and it's working well enough for my application anyway. Next, I guess I should package this thing up. Well, things are progressing along in fits and starts here. I've got uh, a push button wired up to that uh, digital input and onto the ground pin. I've just got it hot snotted in place just gently so it doesn't fall out, but I can still remove it should I want to reprogram this thing. And I've got a couple of notches cut into the case for the wiring. So hopefully that should just snap together properly. Like that. Right. Now then, I have a plastic uh, electrical box. Uh, you can see in the bottom there, it is CSA rated. It's even made in Canada. Uh, plastic electrical boxes are not especially common in Canada. They're very commonly used in the States, but typically, unless it's in a waterproof situation in conduit, in Canada, most of the boxes are still metallic. Um, they're less expensive, which is, I think, part of the reason, and the electricians are just comfortable with them. I don't know if there's any code reason or not, but uh, regardless, this is a proper box, so I can have the connections made in there and then that will just fit in there and I'll put a cover on it with the button coming through and run some wiring up through there where'd the wiring go so the wire I'm going to use is this extension cord it's outdoor rated I don't need it to be outdoor rated for this application but it is outdoor rated anyway this used to be the extension cord that I used to plug in the uh, block heater on my car except for the rabbits chewed through it so I've had to chop a piece out of the middle. It's fortunate for this project because I'll just put this in the middle. More time has passed. I've got the live and neutral coming from the input and the output connected. I've got the two grounds, uh, aka earth, the green wire coming from the cables connected to the grounding strap on the back there, which comes up to the front here to ground the faceplate, if it was metal, but it isn't. Again, I think I mentioned this isn't exactly the correct box for this, but it's as close as I could find. 
if I can find something better in the future, I may replace it. But I've got the button on there, and the faceplate just screws on with the supplied faceplate screws in a color coordinating uh, sort of a color either. So the reason that I didn't want to use standard box, the more common one, which are also much less expensive, is that they are all metal. And if I'm putting a radio device, such as a Wi-Fi uh, switch inside of a box, I can't be having it inside a Faraday cage. That wouldn't work at all. Now, this is probably overkill, but I just want this thing to be protected and safe. Just in case the dog uh, sniffs around it or something. Uh, the kids are old enough to know better than to dick around with electricity. That's my job. But I just want it to be safe and also look safe. Okay, so I'll just give it one final test. I've got it plugged in off the side there. That works. And from the web interface works. I think we're golden. Now the purpose that I've created this whole thing for. Okay, it's all hooked up. Here's what it does. It turns on the 3D printer remotely because as you may recall, I've got this thing hooked up to a, a Octoprint on a Raspberry Pi. So this turns on the printer and it turns on the little Raspberry Pi. Yes, I know the Pi Zero is not recommended for Octoprint. Yes, I know I'm not uh, doing things properly. So far, it's working for me. This is not an endorsement, so I'm pretty sure my main application for this is going to be when I'm monitoring a print from upstairs using Octoprint and I notice on the camera that print is done, I can shut down the Raspberry Pi gracefully. Like that, because of course, like any computer, it doesn't like being shut down unceremoniously. Once it is shut down and offline, and I can go over there and just shut everything else off. There you see the lights have gone off, the printer's off, and nothing gets damaged. Life is good. And of course, with my local button on it, I can still turn it on uh, locally without the computer, should I choose to do it manually. Well, that was uh, a long and winding road for me. And even though this is probably only going to look like about 15 or 20 minutes to you, this was the product of multiple evenings, even before I sat down here and did the introduction. And it was a long day of uh, software uh, messing around. The hardware only took me about half an hour, really. It's the software because, as I'm sure I've told you many, many times, I'm not that good at the software part. Um, if you want to see how not good I am, the link to to the code that I wrote is down in the description, along with links to a few of the resources that I found, or at least the ones that I didn't forget about, the ones I actually bookmarked. Um, yeah, questions and comments, uh, down below as usual. Thanks for watching and I will go get myself another beer. I'll talk to you later.